Good morning, everybody, um, and uh, welcome back after a one week hiatus uh, due to July uh, 4th here. It's really a pleasure to introduce our two speakers this morning. Uh, Dr. Ronald Gassane um, will be presenting the article that uh, was submitted for Journal Club. He is the Director of Head and Neck Pathology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Much of Ron's research has focused on classification of thyroid cancers, and certainly um, the journal article this morning um, is, is representative of that. He has um, done a tremendous amount of work in demonstrating the non-aggressive nature of encapsulated non-invasive papillary carcinoma follicular variant, ultimately paving the way for the reclassification of the entity, which has now come to be known as NIFP. Our discussant this morning is a, a long-term friend of mine, Dr. Bruce Wenig, who's chairman of the Department of Pathology at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. Dr. Wenig has kind of made the rounds and resided in a number of locations after having spent 11 years at the AFIP, where he was assistant chairman and chief of otolaryngic, otolaryngic uh, pathology. He subsequently um, spent time at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and ultimately we overlapped at Continuum Cancer Centers where he was chairman of the Department of Pathology. Um, Bruce's uh, academic achievements are um, many and his textbook on head and neck and endocrine path um, is truly a monumental achievement. I think it's in its 20th edition now. Um, <laughs> uh, um, one, it's the only book that I own that has a uh, health risk disclaimer that carrying it around may be hazardous to your health. Um, <laughs> And so um, with that, um, I know that uh, Dr. Brandwine is in attendance here today as well. And so um, in my career, I often refer to the three of you as uh, having a um, place on, it used to be Mount Rushmore, but um, that is uh, no longer in favor here. So I'm going to put you up on Mount, Mount Olympus uh, for your contributions to head, neck, and endocrine pathology. So with that, Ron, why don't you get us started here? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mark, Dr. Urkun, for inviting me. Obviously, I'm very happy to see Bruce, Dr. Wenning, and uh, I hope, uh, and uh, hope the other participants, hopefully I'll hear from them. And uh, I was asked to start with a poll question. So this is a case of a 53-year-old woman was evaluated uh, uh, for a single thyroid nodule, uh, 2.1 centimeter. Uh, the ultrasound before surgery revealed a solid and hypoechoic thyroid nodule, and the finding that aspiration uh, is was indeterminate, uh, Bethesda category three. There were some uh, prominent nucleoli, nuclear grooves, uh, nuclear inclusion, and um, after thyroidectomy, the pathology report describes a 2.3 centimeter follicular thyroid neoplasm with a micro follicular architecture, uh, one isolated papillary like structure, and uh, the entire capsule, which is very important, was uh, submitted for microscopic examination, and there was uh, no invasion, no capsular, no vascular invasion, no areas of tumor necrosis. And uh, here uh, is the question. Uh, based on the above findings, what would you recommend for this patient? One, no additional treatment. Two, thyroid hormone replacement if needed. Uh, three, completion thyroidectomy, just that. Uh, four, completion thyroidectomy and TSH suppressive therapy. And finally, the whole thing, completion thyroidectomy, central compartment lymph node dissection, TSH suppressive therapy, and radioactive iodine therapy. So uh, I think people can vote now. So um, Ron, you can't see the um, the results of the poll, but 71% um, uh, said no additional treatment, 24% um, thyroid hormone replacement if needed, and 5% completion thyroidectomy with TSH suppressive therapy. Uh, so with this, we will um, see if anyone is swayed at the end, but it uh, sounds like people are taking a pretty um, not aggressive course um, from the get-go here. Okay, so let me start then. Um, oh, can you? Sh I don't know why my screen is not. Uh, oh, let's see. Yeah, great, it's working. So before I start my talk, uh, I just would like to 
say uh, a few words on uh, uh, a pathologist who passed away two days ago, Dr. Juan Ozai, probably one of the most important pathologists of the 20th century. Um, he uh, was a very smart young man since he graduated in Argentina at medical school uh, from medical school at the age of 21. And believe it or not, he described 75 entities. One of them bears his name, Rosai Dorfman disease. And uh, it fits uh, for the talk here since he described many um, uh, thyroid carcinoma uh, entities, uh, including poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma and the papillary, or one of the first description of papillary thyroid carcinoma follicular variant. His CV is enormous, so I won't spend time on it. Just to say that one of his leadership positions was to be the chairman of pathology at Memorial Sloan Kettering in my institution. So he influenced uh, my career as well as many others, other people uh, in my hospital in New York. So now um, this is uh, the paper that is a subject uh, uh, to for the journal club. So basically, very, very briefly, we wanted by quantifying papillae in this paper to see the effect of papillae on encapsulated papillary thyroid carcinoma with emphasis on this entity, uh, non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasts with papillary-like nuclear feature NIFT P. So the way I organize my talk, uh, especially for those of you who are not pathologists, uh, I think it's really important to know how we got there, how we got to the NIFT P. Then we'll uh, enumerate the diagnostic criteria of NIFT P. Then we'll talk about the results and uh, the conclusion of the of the paper. So uh, the story starts in the 1950s. At that time, uh, it was very easy to be a thyroid pathologist because if uh, the tumor grew in papillae, uh, finger-like protrusion for those who are not pathologists, then it was called papillary carcinoma. If the tumor grew in follicles, these round structures, glandular structures, then you call it follicular carcinoma. And then if you had a, a mixture of uh, papillae and follicles, it was called mixed papillary and follicular carcinoma. Now, in 1960, uh, there was a pathologist in California, Stuart Lindsay, who noticed that this papillary carcinoma had some specific nuclear features. Uh, they are clear, uh, uh, irregular nuclei. And he also noticed that though some of the tumor that looked like a record follicular carcinoma had also these clear nuclei. So he coined the term follicular vat of papillary carcinoma. But it's really Dr. Juan Ozai that I just uh, mention now uh, that put the entity on the map when he did a very meticulous histopathologic examination in 1977. So here there are a few pathologic details that are crucial to understanding what happened. So in Dr. Ozai's article, there were six cases. Um, and if you look at uh, the colon uh, of regional nodal metastasis, uh, five of the six had lymph node metastasis, clearly, at least biologically, behaving like a cancer. But there was a little detail that nobody gave attention to, unfortunately, and this is where my arrow is here. There was a colon of encapsulation. And if you look at this colon, all the cases did, did not have complete uh, encapsulation. Uh, uh, the cases who had either no capsule or were... Uh, partially uh, encapsulated. They were really uh, infiltrating the thyroid the same way uh, breast cancer infiltrate the, uh, the breast. Uh, now, however, something happened in the 1980s. Suddenly, uh, a lot of North American pathologists started to call any tumor with a follicular growth pattern with the nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. They started to call them papillary carcinoma follicular variant even if this, these were encapsulated, even if they were non-invasive, uh, uh, just by analogy, without uh, doing any meticulous outcome study for 26 years. I remind you, these tumors were called in the 50s follicular adenoma, since they did not have invasion. And then because of that, there was an important decline in the diagnosis of follicular adenoma and carcinoma. In the early 2000s, we started to better understand the genotype of papillary carcinoma. And one of the things that came up is that the molecular profile of the follicular variant of papillary carcinoma is very different from classical papillary carcinoma. It's 
similar to follicular adenoma and carcinoma. There are a few papers on that. I'll just, just briefly mention two. One by uh, Yuri Nikiforov, that is a very well-known molecular target pathologist at Pittsburgh now. So in this uh, paper, um, uh, in the early 2000s, you can see that the follicular vent had a lot of RAS mutations, like follicular adenoma and carcinoma, and very few BRAF mutations. Uh, <clears throat> in the same uh, um, amount, I mean, uh, still more than follicular adenoma and carcinoma, but clearly the profile is very different from classical papillary where you have um, a lot of BRF mutation and no uh, RAS uh, mutations. Uh, myself at Memorial with the surgeon who were interested in that issue, we did a comparative genomic hybridization study comparing uh, different subtypes of papillary carcinoma you don't need to be a cytogeneticist. When you look at this ideogram that shows the losses in the red and the gains in green on the chromosome, clearly the follicular vet is different from a classical papillary uh, carcinoma. So now the question comes, one second. So if this uh, tumor that is called papillary carcinoma has a different genotype than the conventional papillary carcinoma, is it a form of papillary carcinoma or not? Uh, well, I thought that uh, it's not the genotype they would tell us that, but probably the behavior. So I undertook uh, this study with colleagues from Memorial uh, and with uh, Dr. Giovanni Tallini, who is online with us from Italy now, who is a professor of pathology at the University of Bologna. And we looked at uh, follicular lesion in my hospital from 1980 to 1995 things that were called follicular adenoma, follicular carcinoma, a few follicular variants. But here were the criteria of inclusion. We excluded all sub-centimeter lesion because we knew uh, that their behavior would be uh, excellent. And we excluded tumor with many foci, uh, separate foci of papillary carcinoma, since how can you study the uninodular uh, follicular variant if it's living with 10 or 15 microcarcinoma? So what we got is two animals, so to speak, this encapsulated follicular variant. You see the capsule here in uh, pink and the nuclear features in the inset. And the a totally different animal, the one that Dr. Zai described, which is the infiltrative follicular variant with uh, fibrosis, as well as uh, uh, really usually no capsule or partially encapsulated and you can see here the neuroplastic follicles indicated with an arrow percolating, infiltrating it between uh, non-neoplastic ones. So when you look at the data as far as uh, lymph node metastasis at presentation, you can clearly see a big difference. Uh, the encapsulated follicular vent non-invasive in our data did not have any uh, lymph node uh, metastasis, while the infiltrative one at 65% uh, lymph node metastasis, which is really uh, similar to classical if you manage to take a lot of lymph nodes. And uh, the follicular vent with the capsule of vascular invasion had some lymph node metastasis. And as, you, as I would, sh would show you later, they behave uh, a little bit in a special way. So, but probably the most important finding is that uh, there were cases of encapsulated follicular vent without invasion that were treated by lobectomy alone because I have no idea why the surgeons at Memorial in the 80s did not like radioactive iodine and uh, nothing happens to these patients. So here you have the natural history of this disease without uh, radioactive iodine therapy and completion thyroidectomy and uh, the median follow-up, not the mean, the median follow-up was 11 years with a median size of uh, 2.3 uh, centimeter. Now, if you look at all the studies on uh, the issue, there are many, many, but these are the most important one. Most of the studies did not show uh, in this encapsulated follicular vent if there's any adverse outcome. There was a study from the Brigham that showed recurrence, but according to the pathologist, uh, the margin, uh, the tumor was at the margin, so we never know if it, there was some invasion or if it was infiltrative. Uh, Dr. Livolsi reported even before us uh, on uh, some encapsulated follicular variant. There was one case that was uh, non-invasive, but according to my discussion with her, I think she's on the line, she can 
jump in at the end. Um, this, this, uh, the capsule was not well sampled, but this case had actually uh, bone uh, metastasis. So uh, now we also, what did we did that memorial 10 years ago, we tried to genotype these two subtypes of follicular variant. And you can see that the encapsulated uh, follicular variant has uh, no BRF uh, mutations, a good amount of RAS mutations, while the infiltrative follicular variant has BRF mutations and uh, some RAS uh, mutations. So basically, based on all this data, you can see that uh, the follicular vent is two disease with the encapsulated follicular vent closer to follicular adenoma and carcinoma in its genotype and molecular and uh, uh, spread, and the infiltrative follicular vent closer to a classical uh, papillary carcinoma. And when we did this paper with Giovanni, um, what we said, uh, we were hopeful that maybe one day the follicular vent with 2006 will be reclassified as a close entity to the follicular adenoma and carcinoma group, like basically it was done in the 1950s, nothing new, uh, so that the non-invasive follicular vent will be treated by lobectomy only and spare the patient uh, all the side effect of therapy and the psychosocial impact of a cancer uh, uh, diagnosis. And it didn't work, so I told myself, well, maybe if I put in my personal consult that it is a follicular variant of papillary non-invasive, and I put in a note saying that this is extremely indolent, nothing will happen. Uh, well, I was taught naively completely wrong. Uh, once you put the term carcinoma, a lot of things happens. Now, not everything is my fault, our fault, pathologists. Some of it comes from endocrinologists who think radioactive iodine is water. I'm not kidding. Somebody once told me that. Well, it's not water. It can lower your blood count, it can lower your sperm count. I don't think water uh, lowers sperm counts. And uh, of course, there are surgeons who uh, are very aggressive, who I don't think understand very well the natural history of thyroid carcinoma who will overtreat microcarcinoma. And finally, uh, the culprits are people like uh, my, myself, who fail to communicate the extremely indolent nature of, of this tumor to the, to the clinicians. So after 30 long years of what I think, in my opinion, is overcalling and overtreating, just think about the tens of thousands of people that were <clears throat> that lost, uh, the, not only the thyroid, but maybe the parathyroid and the recurrent nerve for extremely indolent tumor. Finally, people came to their senses, and I'm sure you heard about this uh, big paper uh, that was published in JAMA Oncology. And on this paper, there were a large number of very well-known pathologists. Uh, Dr. Yuri Nikiforov was the first author. I was the senior author. Of course, Dr. Livolsi was on it, Dr. Talini, and uh, Bruce also uh, was on it. So actually, there were 24 endocrine pathologists from all over the world, one surgeon, two endocrinologists, and one psychiatric uh, specializing in the impact of the nomenclature of disease on the psyche of patients. And we looked at the... Uh, a large number of cases, we agreed upon 109 as non-invasive encapsulated follicular variant. Uh, they did not get radioactive iodine. Uh, at least 10 years follow up each one, so the median was high, and uh, all of us were blinded to the cases, except our own, obviously, and uh, nothing happened to, uh, to these uh, patients. So we, we coined this term, which is not a very pretty term, but the most important thing here to understand is that the term carcinoma, the word carcinoma is not there, to stay the hand of uh, the clinician, uh, the surgeon, and uh, the uh, endocrinologist. So what are the diagnostic criteria of this entity? Obviously, it has to be encapsulated or well-defined. Uh, obviously, you need to have no invasion, no high-grade features like tumor necrosis, high mitotic activity. There, uh, there also, you need to have, obviously, some of the nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. Now, there was one issue uh, that was particularly uh, contentious, is how many papillae do you allow in the tumor, in the tumor? Because by experience, we know as pathologists that the more papillae you allow in a tumor, the more the tumor becomes... Uh, um, uh, gives rise to, give rise to lymph node metastasis, even encapsulated one. So after this article appeared and had a lot of publicity in the New York Times and so forth, um, 
three studies appeared done by two groups um, um, claiming that if you have 0% papillae, uh, you have lymph node metastasis to 5%, which is a lot in my opinion. Now we are talking about regional nodal metastasis. And uh, another pa papers, uh, other paper said uh, that if you have a few papillae, you still can have lymph node metastasis. Now, when I read these papers, uh, I noticed that two of the papers did not exclude cases with separate papillary carcinoma. That's very important because then you don't know where the tumor is coming from. Is it coming from the NIFT-P, the lymph node mat, or is it coming from the uh, five, six, seven microcarcinoma that are living with it? One paper, the one that uh, Mark uh, sent you by email, had a good study design since they focused only on unifocal uh, nodular lesion. They excluded separate papillary microcarcinoma. But uh, in my opinion, uh, they should have tried at least to analyze the primary and the metastasis at the molecular level to see if it's coming from there. Because I can tell you that I have seen lymph node metastasis in thyroids where we could not find the papillary uh, carcinoma even after complete sampling of the tumor because as pathologists we only sample five micron of a three millimeter tissue block so uh, it's a very low rate one out of 750 uh, that's how uh, we sample the tumor e even when we look at uh, uh, at everything so in the so because of of these papers uh, uh, there was a reaction of people were scared and then there was a revision of uh, the criteria from less than 1% to papillae to no papillae allow allowed. So this is where um, this paper come in. Uh, by the way, I will just to briefly mention the pathologist on it, uh, Dr. Bin Shu, my colleague from the Hadenic Pathology team at Memorial, uh, Dr. Nora Katabi, the same team, and uh, Giovanni Tallini was on it, of course, just mentioned him. And there is the youngest author is Dr. Azumeli, who is now, uh, who was observed at that time and now is a resident uh, at Mount Sinai West. So uh, what we did here, uh, we just took 235 unifocal encapsulated papillary, papillary thyroid carcinoma. So I didn't care what there was in it, whether they were tall cell, classical, solid, we just took all of them. We didn't take any cases with separate papillary carcinoma. Now, the sampling, as you expect in any retrospective study, was, was fine. I mean, seven, in my opinion, 75% of the tumor had the entire capsule uh, uh, analyzed. In the rest of the cases, the, it was a, a decent sampling, nine section uh, per tumor. So we, me and uh, Dr. Shu, we looked at uh, the cases very carefully. and. Uh, most of the cases I will show you fall at the two extreme, but for those who had a few papillae, we, we looked at them to decide whether uh, these are papillae or not. We also uh, gathered a large number of uh, other clinical pathologic variables, importantly, the regional nodal uh, metastasis status at presentation. And we uh, randomly stained 100 cases with immunostains against the BRAF mutated protein and the NRASQ61R uh, mutated uh, protein. So <clears throat> what uh, we got basically, really most of the cases were at the two end of the spectrum. There are some who had plenty of papillae, very easy to diagnose. Well, this is one of them. You can see the nuclear features, the fibrovascular core, uh, this vessel inside the, the capsule. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this uh, tumor, uh, most of them were BRAF positive. You see the BRAF immunostain on, on the right. On the other extreme, there were cases with a few um, papillae, not many. Uh, this happened to be cases with a few papillae, a very large tumor, and no nodal metastasis. And uh, believe it or not, I think this will interest the pathologist, this was positive for uh, uh, an NRAS. So now let's look at the data. Now this is a very <coughs> heavy table, but just uh, here we separated the cases with uh, positive nodes and from those where there were no nodal metastasis found. And as expected, the patients with N1 disease uh, were younger with more capsular invasion, more exothyroid extension, and much higher chance of BRAF positivity and no NRAS uh, uh, positivity. 
but this is really where the crux of the paper is. If you uh, go and quantify the papillae as much as you can, you notice that the more papillae you have, the more you have a chance of having nodal metastasis at presentation. For example, if you have more than 50% papillae, very obvious tumor, you have like 89% chance of uh, lymph node metastasis, where, while uh, the chances go really very low <coughs> if you have uh, a few papillae or no papillae. I remind you, these are cases even with capsular invasion. Uh, just to, so uh, th that's actually quite interesting. Now, if you case uh, you take uh, cases like I showed you before, with or without capsular invasion, uh, the percentage of papillae are this vertical line here, and uh, you can see here that what I showed you before, there are a lot of lymph node metastases. If you are you have 50% or more papillae, uh, there are also much more BRAF mutations. If you are in that category, there are a few uh, outliers. Uh, we had uh, two cases that had BRAF and very little. Uh, uh, papillae. Biology is not obviously uh, uh, perfect. But this is, I think, uh, very important for the definition of DFP. So if you take the cases that were encapsulated with absolutely no invasion, in our series, you have to wait to 10% of papillae to start to have lymph node uh, metastasis. That's why um, I really think uh, uh, I personally do not agree. Uh, I don't think the paper that were presented uh, by the Canadian group uh, and the Korean group that we showed you uh, represent reality, in my opinion. And this, uh, as, of course, there was a very good correlation with BRAF when it came uh, to encapsulated non-invasive. The more papillae, the more uh, BRAF uh, mutations. Now, if you divide the cases between those who have invasion and non-invasion, Three cases really misbehaved. Uh, interestingly, they had distant metastasis. They were at presentation. Two of the patients died, unfortunately, but there was no local regional recurrence. Now, the follow-up is modest because really our primary endpoint was uh, the status of the nodes at the presentation. In the non-invasive, nothing uh, happened uh, to, these, uh, to these cases. Now, the three cases that had distant metastasis, all of them, uh, were, had follicles. Actually, they were 100% follicles, so they were really follicular vent. All of them had invasion, two extensive vascular invasion. One was a little bit odd, only focal capsule invasion. But very important point, distant metastasis at presentation. And another important point, if you see here, although only three cases, there were no lymph nodes uh, 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 present in this patient. So you see how this uh, tumor uh, this encapsulated follicular, when they have invasion, some of them behave like follicular carcinoma, bypassing the uh, the lymph node. So let's we arrive now to the conclusion of uh, this paper. Obviously, the most uh, uh, clear conclusion is that you know, the percentage of papillae, when the percentage of papillae increase in encapsulated papillary carcinoma, you have more nodal metastasis. Uh, more BRAF mutation, regardless of invasion. Um, if you have less than 1% papillae, whether you have invasion or not, you don't seem to have uh, lymph node uh, metastasis. And in those without invasion, uh, you, as I said, you have to add to 10% papillary growth to, uh, to start to see uh, lymph node metastasis. So I personally think, it is my opinion, based on this data, and but also based on the other data in the literature, because these three papers are kind of um, a minority, so to speak. I think we should just come back to the previous criterion of reinstituted, uh, instituting um, uh, uh, for the diet of the DFP, we should allow again a few, a few papillae. And all this uh, with the purpose of uh, sparing the patient unnecessary therapy with its side uh, effects. We want to spare a lot of uh, recurrent nerves. So just let me finish with these two slides, to, just on a philosophical um, uh, note, so to speak. So what did we learn from this misclassification? That was not a joke. You know, it, it led to, in my opinion, the overtreatment of many patients for 30 years. So we learned that basically uh, you have to put everything together. The, to uh, name a tumor, not only the histology, but the genetic. Because with the follicular vein, we were tipped off by the fact they had RAS mutations. Of course, the ABC 
we should have done good uh, outcome studies on this encapsulated follicular variant. You cannot create a name a tumor or cancer just by pure analogy, pure morphologic analogy. And finally, we pathologists, I'm sure the clinician know that, but we pathologists realize the enormous impact that the term carcinoma has uh, on the patient and the treating clinician, however indolent uh, the tumor is. Because the surgeon on the group said that it's, if I remember, it's very difficult to go back that slope once you have a carcinoma diagnosed to convince the patient of conservative treatment. So let me finish with this uh, statement from Julian Huxley, who was a biologist, a well-known British biologist. He was giving a talk at the Sloan Kettering Institute a few hundred meters from where I am here from my office in 1958, before I was born. And he said that cancer malignancy must be defined operatively in terms of what the tumor cells do, not what they look like. Otherwise, the term ceases to have biologic meaning. And this is the mistake that some um, uh, morphologic pathologists did. And what is said that I see the same mistake done now by molecular pathologists, just because a tumor has a, a translocation, they will label it as uh, belonging to this category or this category we, we, without a good outcome study. And I think that's enough for me today. Thank you, Dr. Erkin. Hey, thanks, Ron. Before I turn over the microphone to Dr. Wenig, I would just include um, a quick statement. If I can encourage our participants to, who have questions to tap on the question icon, um, and I will do my best to uh, get those at the end of Dr. Wenig's talk. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Okay, good morning. I hope you can see the screen. Um, wanted to just thank Dr. Erkin for the opportunity to present here, and it's an honor to share the panel with Dr. Gosain. My task is to clinically analyze the paper that was presented. Um, I apologize, there'll be a fair amount of redundancy with what Dr. Gosain already presented, and I'll try to get it through as briefly as possible. So the stated goals of the paper include um, utilizing clinical evidence-based data um, on the impact of uh, the presence of papillary growth on nodal spread uh, and you know, linked to tumor genotype in tumors that they diagnose as unifocal encapsulated papillary thyroid carcinoma. Uh, the ultimate goal was to determine whether the initial criteria, uh, including 1% or less, less than 1% of papillary architecture, justifies a diagnosis of NIFP. So, uh, as Dr. Gosain already presented, there were 235 cases uh, spanning um, memorials uh, data from 1980 to 2015. Uh, 112 of those cases fulfilled the original diagnostic criteria for NIFP. Uh, the authors evaluated the percent of papillary growth, uh, uh, invasion, capsular or vascular, and, and the uh, immunohistochemical staining for BRAF or NRAF, as Dr. Gosain already presented. The officers demonstrated a strong correlation between the percent of papillary architecture, the risk of nodal metastasis, the uh, phenotypic genotypic correlation to mutation status, and as Dr. Gosain already mentioned, invasion by itself did not predict risk of nodal metastasis. For completion, although it wasn't the uh, focus of the paper, the follow-up uh, basically uh, showed an indolent biologic behavior. Three patients had distant metastases, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. So as already presented, uh, tumors with greater than 50% uh, had a significant increased risk of nodal metastasis and correlated with BRAF uh, immunohistochemical mutation. Uh, tumors with less than 1% uh, papillae had zero risk of nodal metastasis and tended to be uh, RAS immunohistochemical reactive. So there's a clear phenotypic genotypic correlation separating out the presence of uh, percentage of papillae for uh, uh, whether it metastasizes or not. And just briefly, you can see on the screen already Dr. Gosain detail in great detail, the uh, ranges of papillae and their risk of nodal metastasis and their correlation with uh, BRAF and NRAS. Uh, on the bottom of the screen, um, the clear separation of 10% uh, or less uh, were tumors that were enriched with RAS mutation, which tends to follow a follicular adenoma carcinoma paradigm versus those with 10% or more that were predominantly BRAF that correlates to uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma. 
Um, about 12% had nodal metastasis at presentation. These were associated uh, statistically with younger age patients, uh, tendency to have capsular invasion, uh, presence of microscopic extrathyroidal extension, which is, according to the CAP protocol, no longer utilized to upstage thyroid cancers to T3. And 89% <clears throat> predominance of papillary architecture uh, had um, uh, a clinical NX or uh, N0 evidence of disease. So just briefly, um, Dr. Gosain already presented one article that he co-authored about the phenotypic-genotypic correlation of uh, thyroid cancers, you know, a, a very um, uh, instrumental seminal paper, paper by Tom Giordano and, and a large group of authors in Cell in 2014, clearly showed a differential between non-invasive, what was termed follicular barrier and papillary thyroid cancer, having RAS-like tumor, uh, as opposed to invasive PTC that were tended to be BRAF rather than uh, RAS-like. And as Dr. Hussein already mentioned, that created a, um, a study initiated by Yuri Nikiforov with a cast of thousands that included, as Dr. Gosain mentioned, a psychiatrist to determine or to provide to us the, the significance or impact on patients when they're uh, diagnosed with cancer. Even an indolent cancer can have significant impact on one's life. Uh, what Dr. Gosain didn't mention is that the group definitely needed psychiatric care. So the, the, the psychiatrist functioned uh, duly, but this paper was published in, in 2016. Subsequently, this is taken right out of the World Health Organization classification of endocrine tumors uh, that at the time defined if P is non-invasive thyroid neoplasm comprised of follicular cells with follicular growth pattern and nuclear features of papillary thyroid cancer with an extremely low malignant potential. And these previously were referred to as non-invasive follicular thyroid carcinoma. The statistics listed here are out of the blue book, and I think the pendulum significantly shifted with you know new names and people perhaps overusing the diagnosis or overdiagnosing NIFP. So listed here 10 to 20 percent of all quote unquote cancers, even though it's not a per se a carcinoma. Uh, you know, I was guilty of that initially, um, perhaps overdiagnosing NIFP. The reality is that, you know, at least in my practice, uh, it's a rather uncommon diagnosis and perhaps more in the order of 2%. Um, from a cytologic standpoint, the correlations, at least listed here, about 50% of what were uh, diagnosed as NIFP, NIFP were Bethesda 4. Most of the remainders were Bethesda 5 or Bethesda 3, and rarely an outright diagnosis of malignancy. But to quote the authors, the reliable distinction cytologically between NIFP and papillary thyroid carcinoma cannot be made. So the inclusion criteria, and I'm not going to belabor the point, but the most critical one uh, of discussion today is the presence or absence of papillae. Um, since NIFP was initially diagnosed, and the three papers that uh, Dr. Gosain reported uh, and critiqued are listed here, uh, which prompted a reevaluation of the criteria uh, to include uh, the absence of any papillae. So these indolent tumors that lack papillae that fit NIFP um, were so diagnosed, but any single papillary structure would compel a diagnosis of papillary thyroid carcinoma in a lesion that is likely indolent with almost no uh, malignant potential. So there again, the pendulum shifted again based on some literature. So we come back to the article under discussion. Uh, NIFP, tumors fulfilling criteria for NIFP had less than 1% papillary architecture. Uh, as detailed in the study, there were uh, nodal metastases were not identified. They tended to be BRAF negative and RAS positive. The invasive status was not relevant, and, and the, um, the goal of justifying NIFP in the presence of less than 1% uh, pap, uh, papillae um, uh, held true. So what are the, <clears throat> I want to just go through some of the strengths of the uh, paper. Um, it includes a large cohort of, paper, of uh, cases. Uh, unlike some other papers that didn't exclude the possibility of separate microscopic foci, which could have given uh, uh, development of uh, metastatic cancer, uh, there was only a single focus of tumor without any other foci. 
Uh, overwhelmingly, the entire capsule uh, was evaluated, which is critical in trying to determine whether a tumor is invasive or not, because if we don't sample the entire capsule, we can't be sure that somewhere else in that tissue, either in the blocks or not taken, there might be uh, invasive growth. Um, and it did uh, have a very specific phenotypic genotypic correlation. So it's a powerful study uh, supporting and affirming the original diagnostic criteria for NIFP, which is very important because it allows us to move away based on. Um, um, clear-cut criteria from overdiagnosing carcinoma. So rather than, than utilize the term weakness, there, there perhaps are some shortcomings in the paper that I just wanted to go through. Um, there's no doubt that there's a tremendous degree of subjectivity uh, in the evaluation of thyroid lesions in general and nuclear features of papillary in specific. So, you know, this definitely impacts on reviewers and, and uh, biases. So there is subjectivity and ambiguity also in determining what is a true papillary structure. There are no defining criteria in the paper how the percentage were determined. So if it's a three centimeter lesion, what constitutes less than 1% papillae? Um, it's always, at least for me, a challenge to try to come up with an absolute number um, whether it's a proliferation index or percentage of a given tumor to define it as such. So, you know, a larger tumor, how does that correlate to, you know, percentages of papillae? Uh, it's not as straightforward as it may seem to be from the paper. And as I mentioned, there's a great degree of subjectivity in defining the nuclear features of papillary. So, um, this is reflected in a number of papers that I wanted to share with you. This is a paper from Ricardo Lloyd at the time at Mayo Clinic in 2004, in which there were 10 reviewers uh, and 87 tumors were sent to the reviewers. And the primary focus of the paper was to determine whether there was concordant diagnosis among reviewers. You can see here the listing of the 10 reviewers. Uh, and, the, and the percentages of different diagnoses. So um, some individuals felt that the vast majority of these tumors fell into the concept of follicular variant of papillary, while some were under 50%. Uh, alternative diagnoses were follicular adenoma and follicular carcinoma. So the concordant diagnosis among the reviewers was a horrific 39%. So the experts couldn't agree among themselves. Uh, what constituted a diagnosis of follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Another study by Tariq El Sheikh, uh, less reviewers, less cases, but what was unique about this paper was the, uh, the um, reviewers were sent cases twice uh, to record not only the diagnosis among the reviewers, but the diagnosis uh, in each individual from point one month to six months later. And these were cases in which the nuclear features are not well developed. Um, you could see that um, there was a uh, not unanimous agreement in diagnosis in many of the cases, and one reviewer couldn't agree with himself or herself, you know, in terms of their initial diagnosis to their subsequent diagnosis. It just reaffirms the tremendous degree of subjectivity that can exist in certain types of thyroid tumors, particularly in trying to identify nuclear features of papillary carcinoma in certain instances. Um, the uh, subjectivity in, in, and ambiguity in defining the nuclear features are reflected in the paper. To quote the authors, um, the follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer uh, had a, some of their paper, some of their um, cases had a RAS-like molecular signature and a tendency to metastasize to distant sites rather than regional lymph nodes. Again, quoting the authors, there were three patients with distant metastases. The primary tumors were uh, encapsulated follicular variants with exclusive follicular architecture devoid of any solid or papillary component. They had extensive vascular invasion. Uh, one had capsular invasion. Uh, and one patient tested had an NRAS mutation. This is the definition of follicular thyroid carcinoma. So it's unclear to me why this was included uh, in the study and not considered as follicular thyroid cancers by every definition. Again, it gets back to perhaps the subjectivity in reviewing the nuclear features, re perhaps relative to these three patients. Um, further, you know, the authors uh, evaluated for vascular invasion, but there's no um, reporting of lymphatic invasion, which is part of the CAP College of American Pathologists protocol. 
papillary cancers preferentially metastasized by lymphatic and not vascular invasion. So uh, it would have been helpful to uh, have a discussion about what is lymphatic invasion and how it might have been impacted on the cases. Um, there were no components regarding in the presence of some normal bodies, although um, Dr. Gosain didn't mention it, one of the images he showed appeared to have a somoma body. Uh, somoma bodies would exclude a diagnosis of NIFP, but there's no mention of it. Uh, as it happens, I had a case this past week of a three centimeter lesion that had pure follicular growth. It was completely encapsulated. The entire capsule was submitted and evaluated for. There was no invasion. Uh, it may be uh, difficult to appreciate, but portions of the tumor, particularly along the periphery in virtually every slide, had nuclear features that fit into papillary thyroid cancer. Uh, just to show you the contrast, some areas did not. These nuclei are small, relatively round, with coarse nuclear chromatin. And a compare and contrast, even if you don't look at thyroid pathology, I hope you can appreciate the increase in size, the more dispersed nuclear chrominin. So the chrominin, the nuclei look a little bit clearer, might be difficult to appreciate the grooves, the overlapping and crowding, and the reg regular nuclear morphology. So this could fit for a NIFP because there was enough, and there is no threshold in any given lesion below which it's not a diagnosis of papillary and above which it is, it's really a subjective diagnosis. But in this case, there were somoma bodies. So, you know, the paper does not address uh, a, a case such as this. No papillae, no invasion. We didn't have the, uh, I did BRAF, because we have that, it was BRAF negative. But there were significant areas that fit the PTC-like nuclei uh, and somoma bodies. So how does one categorize this? So based on the presence of somoma bodies, even though there were no papillae, this uh, by definition uh, requires the diagnosis of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Um, not every institute, not every pathology department has the availability of immunohistochemical staining for BRAF and RAS. So it's not readily available in, in, in many departments. We have, for instance, we have BRAF, but we don't have uh, RAS immunohistochemistry. So, you know, trying to correlate that and utilize it in any given case may be problematic for any particular pathology group. Um, as an aside, you know, the, the nodes were discussed, but there was no documentation or indication about any of the details relative to the type of neck section performed or the location of metastasis. So just going back to the stated goals and whether the authors achieved these goals, you know, they're, they're uh, attempt was to provide a clinical evidence-based data on the impact of papillary growth and nodal metastasis, uh, and, and whether there's justification in identifying limited papillae to include within the diagnosis of NIFP. Um, the authors found that increased percentage of papillae within the encapsulated PTC was associated with a high risk of nodal metastasis and did correlate with BRAF mutation, and that less than 1% papillae uh, had an indolent biologic behavior and does justify uh, inclusion in NIFP. And, and I'm glad um, that we have swung the pendulum back so that we don't have to uh, overdiagnose carcinoma when it's not justified in a lesion that has limited to any um, uh, aggressive biologic behavior. And just an aside, uh, Peter Saydow in Mass General was among the uh, group that uh, evaluated NIFP, and, and he's the person who suggested the nomenclature for NIFP. Uh, I have always been a, uh, or tried to be a uh, benign diagnostician when it comes to thyroid, so if I'm able to justify benign diagnosis, I will. Um, you know, when we went around the table suggesting t different terminology for this, I said, why don't we just call them follicular adenomas? Because for all intents and purposes, aside from the nuclear morphology, which again is subject is subjective, these behave like follicular adenomas. Their genetic evaluation, genotypic evaluation, is like a follicular adenoma. They're non-invasive and they don't metastasize. So um, tumors with at least one percent papillae um, are at risk for developing uh, nodal metastasis. And, and I agree with the authors that it justifies categorizing these as papillary thyroid cancers with follicular uh, predominant growth pattern. So 
So the unifocal encapsulated PTCs have an overall favorable uh, behavior. The ones with distant metastasis at presentation that were 100% follicular pattern with capsule and vascular invasion and NRAS, to me, I'm always going to call that a follicular thyroid carcinoma. So, But the paper is excellent um, and allows us to scroll back the pendulum to where we can allow for a limited but identifiable papillae in the study. So thank you, and I will bring up the case presentation for those who need to answer it to do so now. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Bruce. We're going to open up the poll and uh, see if we have any divergence of opinion here. Um, what I'd like to do in the time remaining after the poll is complete here is go ahead and um, ask one or two questions um, and then perhaps have um, Dr. Lavolsi and Dr. Bramwine uh, pose some questions or comments as well. Um, but it, let me give uh, the attendees just the opportunity to finish up. And it looks like, boy, it looks very similar, quite honestly, in the outcome of this poll uh, to what it was at the beginning. So with that, Ron, I, my question for you um, really relates to the fact that um, all of these tumors, uh, with the exception of the three that developed distant MET, had an extremely indolent course, with the one major outcome variable being the presence of lymph node metastases. And the challenge, as Bruce identified, is that this was carried out over a 35-year period um, in a retrospective fashion. And during that time, I'm sure that there were contributions from multiple surgeons and we went through an era and uh, various eras of our philosophy about prophylactic lymph node dissection versus um, where we are at the moment, which is the removal of only clinically evident nodes. So seemingly, um, and, and one other variable is obviously the, the contemporary look at the um, various features of lymph nodes and whether or not they harbor um, more aggressive features based on size, number, and the presence of extranodal extension. So with that in mind, um, it seems like the, uh, the presence of lymph nodes, given all of those features or, or those variables, um, represents a bit of a challenge here in terms of interpreting this. Um, and so maybe mm -hmm. if you could just comment on that, and then I'm going to open it up for Dr. Bramwine and Dr. Lavosi. So. Yeah, uh, I mean, we didn't, uh, uh, for those, uh, I don't know if I understood what the question, but just want to say that for uh, those cases uh, with the lymph node metastasis, uh, I can tell you, uh, we didn't record in the paper, but in those uh, few cases with a few papillae that had the lymph node metastasis, actually it was one case with around 5% who had invasion, the nodal metastasis were not large uh, at all. Uh, mm -hmm. Now uh, I have to tell you, uh, maybe more important, what the what the the contradictory papers showed. The papers from Toronto and from Korea, uh, they showed uh, one showed distant metastasis, one case for distant metastasis, but the rest showed a very small lymph node. And actually, in the, I think in their conclusion, they state that although they think NIFP has malignant potential, one should not have additional treatment. So I don't know if I'm able to answer, but basically. To the short answer is uh, these nodal metastases, you're right, uh, don't have, do not have, do not seem to have uh, any impact on on survival, yeah. uh, okay. except if, of course, the nodal uh, volume of nodal disease is high. Actually, at Memorial, patients with small lymph node metastases, we offer to observe them. I don't know if I answered. Well. All right, yeah. Terrific. Can I uh, just see if uh, Dr. Lavolsi first um, has any comments or questions? And then I'll, um, if not, Virginia, then I'll open this up to Dr. Bramwine, who has been uh, texting away here a number of questions and comments. Yeah, first of all, let me congratulate the two of you. It's great to see you again. And um, both of you did an, uh, uh, Ronnie, that paper is, is very meticulous, um, very important. And uh, both of you did very meticulous reviews and, and presentations. So congratulations. Um, one of, well, uh, to, 
to Mark's point about aggressive lymph node status, um, that's, uh, I see that as probably a, an area of growth for pathologists when we do classify in the future. Um, I, don't, I don't see, um, I, I see that there's a place for improvement for pathologists to include the um, ATA, ROR um, variables in the report. So for instance, um, you know, up front um, in, the, in, in the TNM to also put in, you know, aggressive lymph node uh, status. So I, I think that Mark's uh, question is very important. You know, we can have positive lymph nodes and they are really meaningless if it's one or two small mets or three or four small mets. So I think that that's the next area for um, pathology reporting to, to grow. Um, uh, one of the comments that you brought up, Bruce, I was very happy to hear because yes, in truth, um, it's very hard to assess the percentage of anything papillae, tall cell, really anything over many slides of many different um, tumor diameters within the same tumor. So basically, you know, it's, we have a worksheet and, um, and we modify the percentage contribution by the relative diameter size of that tumor for that slide. Um, but, you know, I don't know if the way I do it is any better than just guessing, but, um, you know, it's it's a problem that uh, that nobody talks much about. So that's really it. I, I, yeah, I, I yeah, go yeah, ahead, Ron. Yeah. So uh, thanks, uh, Margie, for this question. So you're right, and of course, Bruce is very right. We do so many subjective things in morphology, and uh, I think in the future maybe we'll do better studies if we use, uh, of course, I'm sure all of you thought about it, artificial intelligence or uh, other technique. We just published a paper in Modern Pathology where actually we have a, a machine here at Memorial where we believe it or not, sounds like science fiction, we do a CT scan of the paraffin block, a micro CT. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. we able, and we were able to uh, get, uh, uh, to identify capsular invasion very well and uh, to, to show that satellite nodules are actually capsular invasion because you go deeply in the, into, into the block in a few minutes, like radiologists go through a CT scan. Unfortunately for Bapile, we, we failed, we, and we put in the paper, we were not able to quantify well because we couldn't see the, the, the endothelial, uh, obviously, cells for to be sure that it's a true uh, uh, fibrovascular, there's a true fibrovascular core. So these are the areas of where automated the microscopy will help, I think. And for the leaf node, we were able to, sorry, I'm talking too much here, uh, to, to calculate the volume of lymph node metastasis in the paraffin block. Uh, maybe one day this will be helpful, not only in, uh, because you know, now we've just measured the, the, uh, the dimension of the metastatic folks, it will be helpful in other carcinomas. But unfortunately, this technology is very cumbersome, take 22 hours to do. Uh, and expensive. Block. Yeah. And expensive. Hey, Ron, one last thing in the, in the uh, 60 seconds that remain, could you just, um, comment on Bruce's um, observation that his, based on the description of the three patients who either presented or developed distant metastasis, that he would have classified these as follicular carcinomas. Yeah. So he definitely is true that they behave, uh, they behave like follicular carcinoma. And now I should have put actually a picture of it, but really they had the nuclear features. Now, of course, he's right. Some people are more aggressive uh, than others. Uh, Bruce is on the on the benign spectrum. I just, uh, um, to be honest with you, I personally think that this encapsulated follicular van non-invasive are basically follicular adenoma with clear nuclei. And uh, uh, Bruce was right, but you know, in the meeting, no, a lot of people did not accept that. <laughs> uh, uh, and, you know, in this meeting, it's not a dictatorship. You have to compromise. It's better <laughs> to move to NIFP than to still call it cancer. And uh, uh, it's true that uh, uh, the, probably the vast majority of, of encapsulated uh, follicular variant with capsular invasion are a form of follicular carcinoma. But it can get a little bit complicated because sometimes the tumor starts to infiltrate in between the neurocrapsic follicles after it has pushing capsule invasion, so you get a little bit uh, uh, into hybrid tumors. But uh, yeah, it's true that uh, 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 I agree with him that it was a misclassification from the beginning. 
Terrific. Hey, listen, everybody. Um, thank, thank you to both of our speakers and to Dr. Brenwine for her comments. Um, these were truly outstanding presentations. Um, thank you to all of our attendees for uh, joining us this morning and uh, hope that you will all um, be back next Friday morning. Um, so thank you all and everybody stay safe.